And it seems like since that's usually the, the first line of supervision, that's the direct raider is the commander, that often that chief is on the way side. Now there may be involvement, but I, I, as a squadron superintendent, I know Senior Reisner's been, or Chief Reisner, excuse me, has, has been a superintendent at a squadron level two. And there is that relationship, but it's more predominantly, it seems like the commander and first sergeant because of that raider supervisory type role. And so it, it was different information for me to receive that the chief is a lot more involved in the first sergeant perspective because I haven't seen that. I have not seen that throughout my career of the chief have a predominant role with the first sergeant. So uh, that, that's my so, I think that's a great question. Uh, uh, and that more so a question more so than trying to attain a perspective, right? And so yes, it's very true that the first sergeant works directly for the commander, but so does the superintendent, right? Superintendent works directly for the commander. What I'll also share with you is this. There are a lot of other NCOs in the squadron that don't work, that, that doesn't work directly for the chief. However, you influence them all day, every day, right? It's no different than the first sergeant. They're still entrusted to your care. And so there are a couple of schools of thought that I've learned over, over my timeline. When it comes down to first sergeant, I hope that we can eliminate and look towards more inclusion, right? And so here's what I mean. As a super superintendent, you tend, do we build the best NCO in your function, or do we grow the best NCO assigned to you? And that's a school of thought. So the first sergeant is not yours t technically by the trade, but they're assigned to you in hierarchy. And so for me, I'm gonna share with you, you own them all. But not just there, it's any enlisted member that, that's junior to you that you come across and your walks across the installation. So I will tell you, embrace them all. Don't get to the point where the first sergeant's not mine. That's another non-commissioned officer in your charge. You need to look at it from that perspective. He is doing a special duty a part of the command team. And from that vantage point, understand the commander's intent, just as you would for the commander's intent in anyone in the organization as the most senior listed member and help the commander get there by taking them under your arms, <coughs> under your umbrella, your charge, and give them guidance to get there, right? They complement the organization, they are not isolated. And that's typically what we do is we look at them and say, oh, it's just the first time I've got to deal with him. Wrong. That's another, NC, another NCO inside of your charge, inside of the formation. You need to make sure that they're mentored, developed, grown alike. And that means, come here, come on over here and let's talk. Let me understand what's going on. Some of the expectations I may have, for example, is if you want me to talk to the boss about personal issues and everything, I, I like to be updated when I, I'm unavailable to go in. And can you share those things with me? Because there may be things that you have or you can help provide guidance on that will help get the team there better versus just one perspective, which may be the first start. But you own them all to include the shirt. You sometimes see a little bit of that disconnect when it comes down to stratifications too, right? Woo! You ain't got there. <laughs> Is coming, <coughs> right? And that's why I say school of thoughts. Is it is the shirt one of yours or not? And I'll tell you, they belong to you. I've never been at a point where I didn't have the discussion inside of the unit where I didn't bring them in. Here's something I also share with you too. When you're looking at development of your NCOs, why wouldn't the first sergeant be included? When you put out an ID card and you say, "What's your rank?" What does it say? Master sergeant. Say chief oh, master sergeant, if you're a chief master sergeant, but the first sergeant won't necessarily say that, you don't get one of them, right? <laughs> you, they'll either say master sergeant or senior master sergeant. Their rank is not first sergeant, that's a duty position. I'd love to clarify that. Hey, first sergeant, I, I say, hey, hey, master sergeant, come here. I have just reiterated something I'm anal that way. They help reinforce you're one of mine as well. When I have a discussion with one of my senior CEOs, and here's why I say that I have a discussion with one of my units, I brought all the senior CEOs in, and the first sergeant didn't show up. I said, where's he at? Well, he, had, he, 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 he said that wasn't for him. I said, call the first sergeant and tell him to get here ASAP. And he got in, right afterwards I said, I said, oh, where's your ID card? Sure, said, let me see it for a minute. He said, well, here, I said, this ain't master sergeant? I said, all senior CEOs, isn't it? He's like, yes, I said, the next time you get here with everyone else, although you're part of the command team, you're requiring all of them to be here, you're part of the team too. Most of the time, your shirts are getting developed at the same time, and that shows the unity of effort inside the unit. So my, my recommendation would be is include them. It's inclusion. 
and you submit that. And that's sometimes the feedback that, that Jason Chief Hart was talking about earlier. We go out, um, they don't necessarily have the support of their chiefs. And that's because right now we don't include them in the things that we do with the rest of the unit. And so we can change that thought, by, that thought process by bringing them in and making sure that when we give guidance to the entire unit, they're there as well. As look at some of the things from operationalizing first time, look at the guidance, personnel stuff, if it's, if it's out there, say, hey, new air fight, dress and appearance, can't shirt, need you to take the lead, make sure you're good to go. Brief all of us and make sure that we're caught up on all the updates. Oh, okay, Chief, okay, squadron commander, sir, ma'am, good to go. But it's inclusion, you know, so that's how you get around it, I think. That scratch your itch. It, it does, sir. Right. Yeah, and it, it certainly does. My, another one of my points was that I just don't, I haven't seen it very often, but you're absolutely right. right about the inclusion. Okay. In my experience, I haven't seen it. The other point, let me hit this, then I get you to. The other point is, is that just because you work for the commander don't mean you're the best master sergeant or senior master sergeant in the unit. Say it for the people in the back, Chief. <laughs> right? Huh? <laughs> it, that, just because you work for the commander directly, you the, the commander's the... the, the you have people who work directly for you. That's a mass art, a senior mass art. They don't make them the best either, just because they work for the chief. Absolutely not. It's performance-based. And so we're talking about that at lunch as well, credibility. So when I go in with the boss and I look at stratification on the headquarters staff, and I go in, I want y'all to know one of them could be easily uh, my exec. I lose all credibility if I go in and think she's the best thing since sliced bread, and I'm only talking about her, and I have an obligation to the entire staff. You have to look at your roles and responsibilities and maintain credibility is no longer looking at just the right, this person, your person. We get so caught up in that, I gotta get my guy, my gal in, I gotta get my NCO in. Absolute <coughs> leadership failure. The, for the institution, we need the best person who's promotable and who can attain that rank coming in. And it's not always gonna be your first sergeant. Here's what I've also learned as well. To be a good first sergeant, get promoted first sergeant, you got to do what other master sergeants and senior master sergeants doing. If all you're doing is first sergeant work, only to come to work and going home, you're going to be a, you're gonna keep that rank. Isn't that what we tell all the other master sergeants and senior master sergeants? Mm -hmm. If you're going to work coming home, you're average at best. And it's the same thing for them. They got, hey, ain't no difference. They just work in a different capacity. Make chief, you got to go do some things differently. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> right? And you go from there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to say, so I've been a squadron super for three years, but at my base for four, and I'm opposite of you. The first surgeons and the, I've had three, all of them are doing exactly what it is you guys are saying they should do. We've not had any issues, but the one thing that I do with my new commanders, which I've had three since I've been there, and my commanders, I'm an OSS, so it's always a fighter pilot who's never been in charge of enlisted. I tell him, hey, you need to make sure you clearly understand the roles of the superintendent and first sergeant, but ultimately we need to work together. It's not me against the first sergeant and vice versa, because both of us work for you, and for us to portray your policy, we need to be on the same page. We may not always agree, but we're the team, and it's more enlightening for my commanders to hear it, and then when we get a new for shirt, he also portrays the same message, and so we work together very well. Okay, good. I'll get you a second. You hear one? Well, to that point is, uh, I think we're in a better position because traditional, the chief is, hey, I work with operations. You handle uh, uh, me at previous church. I think we're in a better position to change mindset. I yeah. mean, we got to be in the same team. Uh, so we're, we're in a good position to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just going to ask, um, earlier when you mentioned kind of like when you have, uh, as a chief of the superintendent of the Spartan Unit, chief, um, and you have these initiatives or different things you want to push to your first sergeant, how do you deal with um, circumstances where the first sergeant says, oh, I don't work for the chief, I work for the commander. But oh, no, like you great. said, when you have that buy-in with the commander, um, and you've already granted the cost who's your boss, then when you go to the first sergeant, um, you let him say, hey, these are some things that I've been thinking we should do as a squadron, and it, because it's in the first sergeant's lane, but when you approach it to them and they say they're kind of having that mindset where I don't work for you mm -hmm. I work for the commander how do you I, that? I think that is that is outstanding oh <laughs> my heart I'm doing cheetah flips inside right <laughs> when you run across that that becomes a, that's an NCO who doesn't understand NCO responsibilities mm -hmm. oh, we are all NCOs in here when you say my rank out loud the last word you say is what sorry, sorry, sorry. 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 I'm a good NCO 
NCOs get out to command the business. And so when someone tells me, I don't work for you, I had that when I was a cop at Amherst, I don't work for you. I said, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> they started smiling, like, what, what do you mean? I said, well, is what I'm asking you, illegal, immoral, unethical? Until they say, well, no. I said, uh, do I outrank you? Yes. <clears throat> is, this is a lawful law. Let's get to it. I've never had, I think you have to understand your NCO responsibilities and the influence and authority you do have as a squadron superintendent because I'm acting on behalf of my commander. Would that be any different if I was going here and say, I need you to take care of this? And you say, well, I ain't doing that. I don't work for you. I said, well, I think that's just absolutely perfect. You don't understand the roles and responsibilities I have as your match comp functional. And let's just talk about them, senior match sergeant, chief select. And what you end up getting in is, oh, it's instant development. Your job is also to educate, train, mentor, and develop. That is an NCO who's not developed and who lacks experience and maturity, if that makes sense. Anyone comes around to tell, tell you, I don't work for you. That's an uninformed, uneducated, unmentored, inexperienced senior non-commissioned officer. And nothing more important than your ability to influence and shape and change that. <clears throat> you know, I have other chief, I've had other chiefs tell me, well, I ain't coming. I say, well, that's OK. So right, we're all the same, we're all chiefs. You agree with that? No. no. I said, if I can have you come to my office in a full service dress and issue you an LOC or LOR, then we ain't the same, are we? <laughs> well, that, oh, it, it, yes, chief. It's amazing. I, but, the, but the thing is, is, with that, you can't abuse authority. That makes sense. So make sure that they're not illegal, they're more unethical, and you will, you will never have that problem and leverage your experience to get the first start to buy in what you're doing. But it comes with trust and credibility as well. And I think if you're doing those kind of things, you're leveraging, you have to give them the why. Just as I'm sharing with you the why. On the programs I've earlier, I'm telling you the why. I'm asking these things. You're like, okay, that's good. It's no more you chief. You say, uh, Tony, I, I, I don't understand that. Uh, I, you, this is what you told me for the group. You got to get, I need to understand it so I get the buy-in to, to jump on this. I said, I just need you to accept it. Don't just be anti this. That's what I told her. She said, come on. <laughs> right? But she's wholeheartedly, that's the truth. I have to explain to you where we're going and why we're getting there. And once I do that, typically I'll be like, oh, that's not bad. That's, that's, not, that's reasonable. And we're good to go. Sometimes we'll disagree and we just have to move forward. But you have to trust that you're doing the right thing. So... Uh, for me, I've always sat down the edge and said, come on, let's just talk. Is this illegal, immoral, unethical? No. I need you to, to jump on. If you have questions about this, then we can continue to discuss that. But we need to sit down with the boss. That's one thing. And, and then, typically, I've never had that ever happen again. But this only happened to me twice in my career. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Are, are you good? Absolutely. I'm always good. Okay. Can <laughs> you use this thing? Oh, now we're good, sir. Okay, so up next is uh, Chief Karras. Jason's been with me now, I think, probably about a year and a half, two years. Two years, so he's been with me since uh, I arrived. I was there, he came on, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, as we look at different programs, different things we do in the command, you're not going to be successful without a good A1 team. And uh, I'll tell you, between Colonel Parrish, his boss, the director, and his team that he has down there uh, on the first floor, it's just simply phenomenal. I've not run across a lot of, a lot of people on my team. And, and, and <coughs> Chief Hodge is, is, is like when you talk about something, they jump on it and start moving the machine to get there. A lot of things people think is, is my ideas and other things I'm doing, but really wholeheartedly ones that you see here today with Glockner, uh, starting uh, Bridges, uh, Devon as well, Chief Karras, and <coughs> Chief Hodges. Those are the ones who really are the, the, the muscle behind the machine and getting to those things. And so uh, I'm, I'm great to have him here today and for you all to talk to him. You look at your assignments, getting ready to go somewhere, getting ready to get after it. Most of the time, your command chief, y'all fuss about it at the group, the wing, and then the phone call goes to him. Sometimes I'm CC, sometimes I'm not. And then when they need an extra muscle, they'll, you know, he hits me up and says, hey, we need some help. And then from there, uh, I try to support where I can, right? And so with that, uh, over to Chief Karras, our A1. Chief Johnson. Chief. Real, real quick, did you have anything for the internationals before we head to our break Oh, now? that's right. They're getting ready to go hang out with the other internationals and uh, Chief Wright and all of them. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for being here. It's been a wonderful week with you all. Uh, I'm sure the team's had an opportunity to work alongside you as well. Safe travels back to your AORs. I look forward to seeing you all here. 
uh, the coming weeks to a couple of months down the road. Thank you. Y'all please give them a round of applause. Oh. Oh. Kia ora. See you in May. <laughs> Off to Japan. All right. <laughs> so, as, as important as it is to have a good A1, you also have to have a great command chief, I mean, a command team. And, uh, I, and I think we really do. And one of my misunderstandings about Chief Johnson initially was his passion. Ooh, I did not understand that passion. But once I understood it, we were able to leverage it um, and utilize it to get our, our initiatives done uh, for our command. But uh, thank you, Chief. You know, thank you for everything you've done because what you're going to realize the things that we've got going on in command don't happen by accident. There's a lot of thought put into it, and uh, we're able to move on a lot of things. So uh, we talked about the triad within the squadron, your commander, your chief, your first sergeant. Well, in the A1 community, we got something very similar. we got our EPME manager on staff, and you got myself, but we also have AFPC. So what we've done today was uh, we brought our AFPC, our counterpart in as well, and he's going to tell you about some of the things that they've got going on at their AFPC. Things that directly impact your airmen. So we felt, what a better audience to have uh, here in front of us, and that is uh, our chiefs and our, our selects. We, we talked a little about PACAF pride, and, and, and I, I love the way Chief talks about it because I'm very much the same way. Don't ever talk about PACAF in a negative way because it just, I get, get teed off, I get pissed off, and, and I'm just ready to get after it. And how we get after our, our initiatives here in the command is that I always tell a Chief a couple things. Chief, this is what you're going to experience, with things you're going to run into. Here's how I recommend you, you tackle it, and here's why. And give them all those backgrounds. So with any, any of our command chiefs we have in the command, we want to have, have those guys have the information at their fingertips. Because as, as they engage you and as they engage those airmen out there, we want those guys to deliver that information in a timely manner. We don't want those guys coming up with the stories or, or the thought process the way they think it is. We want them the true information. So uh, at the basis, when you guys get together with your chiefs, because one thing I'd recommend is give your FSS, have some of your FSS come over and always brief you. Let those guys tell you about the, the policies and the procedures that are going on. About policy and procedure, how much like that? If it's illegal, immoral, or unethical, we'll find a way to yes. And if it's policy that's stopping us, we'll find a way around that as well. There's two things that we don't have in our command that maybe other commands have. We don't have any problems because our problems are, you know, are opportunities to get, get things uh, done. And we never say no. There's always a yes. Again, if it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical, we'll find a way. Yeah, I got a policy background, and, and I'll research every AFI that I can to make sure that you, your airmen get the benefits that they deserve and the opportunities that they deserve. But I also need your help as well. I need your help by you doing your job at your end. Because if things bubble up to our, our level and they're not fully vetted, then there's, there's an issue. You, as a chief, lose credibility. Uh, as a chief, you also lose credibility among those airmen as well. So help us help you guys. Before I go any further, though, let me introduce uh, CMS Sergeant Edwin Bridges. Edwin uh, come, came to us out of AFPC. He, he did a lot of the heavy lifting for EPME and all the development we, that took place in about 2015, 2016. And uh, so we'll have him brief a little bit about EPME, and then we'll have uh, uh, Jason Surratt from AFPC talk a little bit about, about the things that, are, that he's working on uh, for that command, as well as Big Air Force. Hey, good afternoon. Welcome back from lunch. I'm so excited to be able to share about the list of PME. And I think as chiefs, that's going to be one of the main topics that you all have is, hey, one, when would you attend the chief leadership course? But two, your amateur, I'm going to always be concerned about when am I going to attend NCO Academy. And so as we go through the conversations today, I want to be able to just provide you a little bit of insight on that, but most important, have some dialogue. One of the key people at your organization or at the base is going to be your former training manager. And the reason why I say that is because AFPC directly involves them in all the dialogue, the conversations, and also provide them resources that are at your fingertips. One of the resources is the AFPC Workforce Development SharePoint. And how you can direct to that, if you go out on my person, if you have a pen and paper, I would want you to write this down, is Article 39144. Or any of you just go out and type in EPME in my per search engine, and it's going to take you to a resource, I mean, a resource that gives you all the references that may not be specifically in the AFI because all of the how to's are coming out of our personnel AFIs and giving you those directions through my purse. So, for you as chief leaders, chiefs, 
your opportunity to attend the chief leadership course will come up here very soon. And so it's based off of those who already have chief on, those who are select, and then it prioritized based off of your time and grade. And so you all have an opportunity to go to um, here at Maxwell Garner to attend the chief leadership course. If you want to know that prioritization, if you go on the AFPC Workforce Development SharePoint, it's going to list you one to N on how you are prioritized to attend the course. Based off a show of hands, I know we have a couple of chiefs and have you attended the course already? Or are you scheduled to? Okay. Some of you are already scheduled to? Good. Now I guess the other thing is if you have some timelines that you're up against, if you know based off of the chiefs that are already scheduled on the base, if you want to be used as a replacement, let your former training office know so that they can reach out to you and see if you're available to attend at that time. Any questions thus far about the chief leadership course and when you're scheduled? Can you repeat that article number? Oh, 393444. And if you can't recall that, just go in and type in EPME in the search engine at the top right hand corner and it's going to take you directly to that article. There's also a personal service delivery guide that tells you who's eligible to attend and also who's ineligible. And so just based off the top of my head, I want to share some of the ineligibility codes. Those who are pending investigation, those members who are serving on the MEB, um, those members who are about to PCS within 120 days of their d rolls particularly those who are in the Oklahoma's location, such as Joanna. Now that can also be waived in a sense because really we often want to make sure that they can prepare to uh, go to the next base without having all the hardship of going to the PME. But I will waive that that requirement so they can attend based off of the situation where it is. So you can always bring that up to your former training office and they'll ask me and I'll send us a note to AFPC to ensure they're good to go. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, are we also addressing the uh the shortfalls for uh, formal training because we mentioned how important they are. And right. most of us we're like below the worldwide average for formal training. Yes. I can speak specifically for Anderson. Mm -hmm. So I know that's something we have to work on. Can you give us like a timeline right. and where we can actually is it because of the conversions that has been recently happened? Okay, so one of the recent conversions at former training offices, if they had an active duty personnelist in that position, they were converted to three of twos. That's education and training. And so because we are below the worldwide average, then that's what we're going to be working with the MPS and ensure that we can continue to sustain that. And that may be some help from the personnelist community until we can get healthier than we are right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that probably within PACAB, me being a functional manager for education and training, that's going to be one of our number one positions to fill outside of the master sergeant position. That's a priority position for us. And so we'll continue to articulate that, working with Chief Carroll's going through the FSS to make sure that is widely known. Do you have any questions about, about EPME? I know I started with just talking about the Chief Leadership course, but there's also rosters out there for the NCO Academy as well as the Senior NCO Academy. Yes, sir. NCO Academy, this is where we need your support. <clears throat> you want to hear it, me? Deferment? Uh, no, the scheduling. Okay. As it comes right now, it should be no surprise when it's time for your NCO to go to school. But for some reason, y'all get this shocking out, it's time for me to go. I can't make it. Again, why are our NCOs hitting into deferments when it comes down to going to the academy? Nothing is more important than the development, education development of our people. <coughs> now, what I'm getting at that is uh, uh, the first sergeants do a wonderful job with ALS. NCOs, we hands off. CNCOs, we hands off. Chief leadership course, we hands off. And I need y'all to be hands on. There's nothing more reflective for me. And I look to talk to command chiefs and I start now diving into a unit. Well, why is this person always late? Why are they always deferred? And we'll come in. I said, Chief, why didn't you know about this? Well, what do you mean? And I, again, I need y'all involved in these things. If not through you all, give your first arm as well. But this is a command team issue. It's a leadership challenge. Our NCOs should go to PME, they should go to NCOAs, and we shouldn't have all the deferments. Because now it's a crisis when it's time to put that line number on. Oh, you want me to stop and, and, and create and, and dissolve the world to get them in then? And I'll ask, what was, where was the crisis and the, and the importance of getting them in sooner? 
if that makes sense. And I go back to my, I go back to my philosophy. One person won't kill a unit. Because emergency disorder, they need to leave, we'll get them out the door and get them done. But we won't send them to school. So I need your help to resolve that. We have horrible statistics at the NCO level and getting them scheduled and getting them into PME. Just saying. So one of the other key elements about that is, how many people know how far in advance is AFPC scheduled and AMA to 10 of PME? 120 days. And so 120 days out, they're notified to attend PME. They are scheduled, a notification rip goes to the formal training. And so that's where my engagement is with the formal training, ensure that those rips are going out to your members. And so as chiefs, I would solicit you to ask, hey, one, if you haven't seen that, uh, those who are scheduled, reach out to your formal training office to bring that awareness. Because I feel, and not all the time, but 120 days is good to get your life in order before you head out to PME. But how many of you have ever received a notification 120 days out saying you're going to PME? And so that brings a lot of stress, right? You can plan as a chief to make sure that you have proper coverage. And, you know, and now you can work in the organization to make sure that people are taken care of. And so that's the efforts that we have going in the FSS, but also I need your help and to reaching out to the formal training and say, what's the current status of those members who are time? And I can always send a schedule out to the formal training and also through FSS that can get to you or even through the command chief so that you can look and see, okay, this class is, you know, in December, you know, four months prior to that, everyone is scheduled. Because that's one of the main things that we had going on previously is members were saying they, they received notification 30 days out or two weeks out. And in my mind, coming from FPC, I was the one who was initiating that process. I was like, that's horse buggy. <laughs> Crazy. And so with that, uh, you will have also NCOs who want to go. Do you know who they are? I'll take an alternate. I, I, I'll, I'll be an alternate. I'm ready to go right now. Do you know who they are? You should have kind of those things with your shirt as well and knowing who you can plug and program in based on the eligibility, right? So you'll have the opportunity if, if, if it always says it's on the unit. One defer, you've got to put somebody else in. I would kind of know who those people are already and have that in your playbook, right? Again, it's saying, hey, most times the first time do very well with that ALS, they run. But it kind of hands off because it kind of goes from APC, but that doesn't mean between you and your command team that you can't know who's eligible and kind of get them to knowing what goes on. So as a command chief, I would always, if, the, if my academy was elsewhere, so I was at Albiano. So I've been overseas the last 15 years. I'm at Albiano and I said, I want to see all the NCOs before they go. Bring them all in. Now look at them. There's things you can look at by looking at a dude and a, 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 I'll say airman. <coughs> this happens to be a guy I'm talking about. An airman in full service dress. So he came in and he had no devices on none of his ribbons. I said, well, how long you been in? He said, 15 years. I said, really? Based on your ribbons, I don't only think you've been in three, uh, just slightly over four years. He said, why do you say that? I said, stand up. Come up here in the front, let everybody look at you. I said, there's not one device on your entire ribbon set. You've been in how many years? He said, 15 years. I said, typically, it'd be a good conduct medal. It'd be something on the longevity. There's things you can just look at, team. I'm just speaking to my experience and quickly surmising what I do when I see you. And from him, he had nothing. To, but, but he knew he was coming to see me as a command chief. Who else would I fault on that arrival? Chief. I'm looking, no, I ain't looking, no super, I'm looking at you, too. He representing your squadron. Not only did you know he was coming in there, right? I fought the supervisor, too. This is a technical sergeant. This ain't no any sergeant. They knew he coming, right with me at the wing. And so I go through those things, preparation. Who sits down and makes sure that, again, it's just leadership stuff, how they learn. This could be your talks with them. Do you have your stuff ready? Depending on your AFPC, how many uniforms are you supposed to have? Well, your phase is that just bring some of them in. Just bring the uniform. You don't have to wear it. Just bring them in. Really? When they go to the NCO Academy, they borrow them pants. Borrowing uniforms. I said, now that's look for a guy about 6'3". It was a guy, it was a guy his height. Stand up for a minute, stand up for a minute. It was a guy at NCO his height, and he's wearing my pants. I said, man, you need to get them up. Uh, this is no way. These are yours. He said, well, these are mine. I said, well, you going to go get the hymns up today. Go right over there. I was in Japan at the NCO Academy in, in uh, Irwin. I said, head right over to, the, to uh, the cleaners and get them some. He said, you want me to? I said, get them done. Them your pants. It's no problem. <laughs> 
He said, he said I, 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 I said, oh, so you lied to me. I said, go buy you some new ones. He said, oh, okay, Sergeant. I said, hey, I'm ready, and, and uh, next week, it'll be good to go. You'd be amazed. The things they'll share with you when they get ready to get the ticket to go, right? But we should always be ready. So different things to put in your toolbox when dealing with PME. But we should always know when they're going. So with that being said, another <laughs> thing that you can tap into is your career assistance advisor. Uh, some of the programs that we're working on right now with Chief Johnson is ensure that there is a clear path for development. He's already touched on development, but we're working with the career assistance advisors to try to standardize some of that within the uh, command. Hopefully, you've uh, heard your career assistance advisor talk about that, maybe solicit some feedback from the staff and techs, and show of hands, who knows it, any type of involvement there? Okay, no big deal. But I've already received the feedback, <laughs> those are some of the things that we're working on to ensure that we have a clear path for development throughout that guy. Any questions for me? Yes, sir. He says a little bit about the package and the Okay. Right, my first time. Okay. So we had Pacific Strike. That was at the 1st of February, I think we executed it. Uh, we brought about, as you mentioned, three people from East Insulation. We had a lot of chiefs that were serving on the headquarters staff and also some other subject experts. And we provided them an opportunity to have candid discussions <clears throat> about the things that were going on afterwards, things that were going on in command, and also <coughs> things that were going on in the insulation. So we got rating reviews. I had an opportunity to see all of that feedback. But as mentioned, these are some of the things that you can extend and do in your squadron. Building a, a standard schedule, having them to come in for two or three days and develop them because they were hungry. I can assure you that we had Raven views where they say, I wish I had something like that in my base, but guess what? You have an opportunity to touch people's lives in your squadron. And so take that as an, an idea. Right? As we're talk, taking notes, I have plenty of notes of things that I can share as I go into my next endeavor, and hopefully you will take that item as an action. And so the intent of uh, Pacific Strike is really for us as senior leaders across the Air Force to kind of give them some things that's in between formal PME, right? So we want to infuse those leadership traits and ideas, thought processes into some of our high performing potential NCOs at the staff and tech level. Because you all aren't nominating or sending me disgruntled employees, you're sending me some of the very best. And so while they're there, they're having opportunity to touch one, I said Commander Pacific Air Forces, our Chief of Staff, we had a couple of those two GOs came in. We brought in the PACOM, Indo PACOM, Command Senior Enlisted Leader. He had an hour uh, and a half, I think, with him as well. I had time, I think two, three blocks. We had a senior mentor from 11th Air Force who was with them the entire week in Chief Wolf. It was a fantastic uh, development <coughs> opportunity. I'm looking at different ways I can do that for the different tiers. We also do one with the Junior Enlisted Leadership uh, Forum where we bring in all of our internationals. That's one we have not as many U.S. members, but we take all the countries you saw here and we put them in one area. We've done that in Australia, uh, New Zealand. We're going to Canada this year to do it there, uh, hosted by the Canadian Air Forces. And it's another opportunity now to train and, and, and to be developed alongside our international partners. And so I'm looking at different ways from a developmental point to where I can have targeted development through all of the tiers. The ones you talk about, the career assistance advisor, they are your focal point for the command chief at your installations. Through them, what's the standardized formula and what does it look like? Whether it's the airman tier, typically you have an airman in PES, an NCO PES. Senior NCO PES is done when what? When do we do the first time for a master sergeant? When the first time we do some development with them? When you make master. Don't see no other time outside until you get to a formal training. What do we do for senior master sergeants? What do we do for y'all? So why isn't there something for you all? So I'm looking at those opportunities right now when we can come in for masters, seniors, chiefs, and then look at the NCO realm and airmen and really kind of codify a platform and say at a minimum you'll have these things for development at our installations and then still provide flexibility of the command teams at that base through our commanders, chiefs, first sergeants, whoever's feeding in and say we now also want to do these things for us flight chief course, superintendent course, something for our spouses. I don't want to get involved in that. I want the standardized, I think, minimum courses we need for development for our ranks to make sure our airmen are still being developed and know the uh, expectations that we expect of them at those rank and roles. And if we can do that right, we're good. We'll talk more about resiliency later on all things we're doing there too, sir. And with that being said, I'll turn it back <laughs> over to Carol. 
So they're going to switch up real quick. Hey, Jason, you want to go now? Sure. This is Let's get the microphone, boss. Is he going to mic today? Yeah, no, he is. They're doing a little bit right now. You so you can just go. Yeah. I don't okay, want great. to stop the show. So, uh, uh, as, as, as we said, my name is uh, Senior Master Officer Red. If you say Sarah, I know you got that from Chief Fryer because they want you to call me outside my name and that's him because I, I like him, frankly. Um, but first things first, right? AFP does not suck with all respect, sir. It does not suck. Um, however, we do have some things to work on. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is what we need to work on, right? How we can function together as a team. Because as a chief said, even though we're chiefs, we work for somebody. There's a million chiefs at AFPC, and guess who we work for? We work for Sergeant Wilson at the MPF. We work for every single one of you chiefs. And Chief Lindsay works for all the command chiefs as they roll up. So you heard yesterday Chief Lindsay talked a little bit about how to function and he gave you the list of POCs, <coughs> Chief Pryor, Chief Baxter, Chief Wilkerson, uh, and Chief Hodges for DP0, oh, and uh, Senior Comer for DPF. So those people are your entryway. The reason you'd want to use those people is so that we can track it, right? Because the things that we have to work on is clearly our mindset. The longer you're doing something, and if you notice the AFPC is the mecca for personnel, the longer you do something, the more involved you become in it and the more you become passionate about it. And that's what we have. We have a bunch of passionate personnelists who are kind of afraid to make a mistake. The mindset that Chief Lindsay is getting towards and, and, and the reason that I'm in assignments completely is because I don't know about assignments. Um, and, and the mindset is to let it go a little bit, right? We want to get to yes. We don't want to get to right because right is not tangible and right depicts emotion. That says what's my right versus your right. That isn't it. We want to get to your yes. We want to get to the commander's yes, to the chief's yes, because that's tangible, right? That's a black and white standard. We want to get to yes. So what is your role in getting to yes? Your role is to tell us what you're really trying to do. So I'm going to pick on Chief Karras because he called me out just a second ago. So if you want to, if you want to deliberately develop somebody and, and we'll just say do a PCA, right? If that's what you want to do, we need to know that up front. Don't ask us for an assignment swap. Right? Don't ask us for don't ask us for something that you think we want to hear. We want to know the story. Share the story with AFPC. Share with us what you're trying to do. The intentions are the same, and, and you heard Chief Lindsay give the same uh, a speech also, and it, and it ties <coughs> right into Chief Ryan. I hate to keep using somebody else's name, right? But our leaders, our boss gets his message from the chief of staff, right? And Chief Lindsay gets his message from the from the chief master sergeant of the Air Force, and our intent is to revitalize the squadron. We can't do that by so, or centralizing personnel and your manpower and not have any input from you. So tell us what you want to do. We are, our intentions are the same. Revitalize the squad and deliberate development, resiliency, all the big rocks that we went over just yesterday. That's our intent too. But we do have some sticking points, right? So that's why you have to know who to reach out to to make sure that you can function within that. So um, <laughs> there's something else, and, and the reason I'm going to put my name out there is because to get to that, we're trying to figure out what's wrong with our programs or what kind of things we can do. That's where I come in completely, right? So I am in charge of personally, and I have a team, so we are in charge of the enlisted assignment working group. That means we're trying to change the enlisted assignment programs for the better. So you've seen that already. You've seen the, the BOP program transition and broaden, and now we have CONUS assignment program, right? I'm not here to get into the programs and all the AFIs and those kind of things. But it, it evolved to that. I'll stay for questions because I know you guys are going to have some. It evolved to we have a CONUS assignment program. So we work the Advanced Orders Initiative. Anybody at OSAN right now? So the Advanced Orders Initiative, if you're at the Chiefs Group meeting, I came and talked to the Chiefs about that. We're giving orders in advance. Here's your orders. And now, Chiefs, you guys are responsible for making sure everybody out processes. Why? Because it gives flexibility. Now the family members can plan. We just heard about it with the PME stuff, right? You can plan ahead. So you have orders, you can be flexible with TMO, you know where you're going, you know what everything's going to happen, and you're responsible, your personal discipline, your squadron discipline is responsible for making sure you can out process. Um, so why did, I, why did I drop my name? Number one is because I want to know what your ideas are, right? I'm tired of making decisions in a bubble. I don't want to hear what a personnelist who's passionate about what they do says about assignments. I'm tired of it, I'm really tired of it. But I get nowhere, and like I said, I'm the guy who doesn't know assignments and I get beat up by all the people who already understand the AFI, but I'm asking the why behind it. It doesn't make sense. I don't want to do it anymore. But they say it's the rules. Rules are rules, people. 
So I don't want that. I want ideas from you to flow in. I want ideas to come from, we're gonna start pulling in our AFPC assignment functionals so you guys have some functionals on the floor, right? And I wanna get the feedback from them versus a feedback from the person or people that are controlling AFIs. And so I'm talking about assignments specifically at this point. Um, so what I'm working on currently and what you're gonna see next is uh, all the A1s are coming to you, Carol, you, you get a glimpse behind the curtain. Um, they're coming for our developmental board and I'm gonna to talk to all the A1 chiefs and we're gonna ask for representatives from the bases to come talk about Kona's reprioritization. Some of you guys are gonna like this, some of you guys aren't, right? But why does the guy who's been at AFPC for eight years, I mean at uh, Hickam for eight years, get priority over a guy that's been in Minot or a, or a TI that was crammed into a job busting their butt for four years or whatever. We, and that's how it is right now. You're coming from overseas, you get priority. So you go from Hawaii, dream job, to Patrick, whatever you want next, so, or even overseas. So those are some things that we're, that we're trying to get around on. Um, so here's some things that you need to consider, right? I'm going to backtrack just a second because I put my notes down and I missed one piece. Um, when, you're, when, we, when we're getting to yes, we might not be able to do it exactly like you want to do it. That's why you have to share it with me, right? We do have some law. So the DOTI, it's, it's AFI or it's DOTI 13, 15, 18. You have to Google it. I don't know where to find it, but there's a DOTI club somewhere. I Google it every single time. It's huge. Google it. If it's in there, we can't change it. It's law. If it's in 362110 or uh, any, any of the other ones, the relocation deal, uh, AFI, those kind of things. We can change those. Those are the things we can work around. That's the exceptions to policy that you're asking for. And once again, if you, get in a, if you get a question and we say no to what you're trying to do, Chief Lindsay will tell you he wants to know who said that. If it's assignments, make sure that I'm on there. It's important because <laughs> sometimes I get strategically left off working on it. Right? We've got things to work on. Um, but, but if you get a no, um, it, it, hopefully you have some kind of answer or reason why and a solution, some other way to work around. It might just be requesting man through your functional or something that's very much so in our future. I think that's all I got. One question I'll ask um, on behalf of PACAP is that, you know, so we have a lot of folks that go from overseas to overseas to overseas. We got potentially that guy over at Shaw who does uh, multiple short tours and goes right back to Shaw. Is there any thought, any idea of, now that the Dodi has given us some flexibility of taking a guy from a long, long tour and making him a non vault to a short tour? Um, I think so. Long to short, you're gonna you're gonna make me quote an AFI. I'm not ready for that. So um, <laughs> because because that yes, because the door right. Because remember, I told you I personally don't know that. But I'm gonna tell you this: that um, we're trying to unclog the overseas rotation, right? So if we have guys that com they raise their hand, I've been at we'll say Shaw for 17 years. They haven't been hit with a non vol That's why they've been there so long because their career fields are big. So security forces anything big, they have to volunteer to move. And what they're not doing is moving. That's part of the challenge with the CONUS priority, right? So that's why we always take overseas first because they did their they did their uh, they did their time or whatever. What doesn't? Uh, I, so you say the Doty opens up a little bit. the the real The real problem with overseas and, and the reason you get overseas first, so consecutive overseas tours, is because it saves money. It takes out a PCS from the equation, and that's bottom line. We can't get around it. So if you keep trying to go from um, it's, it, I think it's short, long, short is what you can't do. So the other part is, is you can do that all day as far as the consecutive or But I will take a couple of questions. Not necessarily, sure right? I and so, uh, to my there's a policy that limits E8 and below to two assignment, two overseas assignments. Is that true or not? So each, so the Madness, the Madscoms have that. So PACAF has that consecutive overseas tour in place. No, but no, no, that's not what we're talking about. I'm not talking about consecutive overseas tours, because I'll get to our DROS management policy later. later. Yep. But I'm getting at right now, saying the functional community, we just relieved that for the Chiefs. Meaning, you can only have two consecutive overseas assignments that you got to go back stateside. Right? So we relieved that pressure on Chiefs. We said no, because if it's the right Chief for the right job, right. there needs to be that person, especially when we talk about the CIP, interview process, and those kind of things, you have the right skill set. It was more talking more about two alpha threes where we were short, right? And so we relieved that for, we took that out. We got rid of it, right? And that was a key contributor to it. Right. It made no sense to me. Meaning they could stay overseas. They could stay overseas? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, I was also told that it's the same for E8 and below to help with the rotation and eliminating some of the fog that you have in the constant people staying 17 years in one location. Really? To get them to 
move a little bit better. It's easy to manage us because we manage by DROs. Right. Right? Yeah. But why can't airmen, they want to stay overseas, can they stay? They can. So, but it's not, but so PACF, your policy, right? Yes. Um, um, you don't have to look at him. You look right here. I'm, 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 I'm a generator crafter. Right. Yes, right? Sir. <laughs> so, that's, so that's the only policy the, that the I know. The policy says, says you can only stay in eight years in one location. Right. It does that's not say it. you cannot go over. And we yep. took the IPCOT, COTs, all that stuff yep. out. Yep. So I'm going to help you with it. So none of that's inside of the current d -Rose policy level. Right. All it says you cannot stay in eight years in one location. You can do eight years in Hawaii, you can go to Japan. Okay. Yes, I think yeah. we're saying the same thing, so I might have answered the question wrong. But we'll ask that again, because that's exactly what I'm tracking. Well, well, I'm just looking, so the functional community is where we need the help. Okay. We've gotten out of the business. So what I'm saying is that we've gotten out of the business of D-Rose management, and we're putting this revitalized the squadron, we're putting this back down to squadrons. For example, who's in here in Korea? Right. So if you're in Korea, nowhere not d rose management policy say on nothing in the indicates remote. It says eight years one location. So as far as myself and General Brown are concerned, you go to Korea. You can stay eight years. I don't really care. If the commander determines that based on performance that you're the right person. However, that ain't what the AFI is gonna say, it's not what the commander if the functional community says, you can only do a remote, that's it, you gotta go. For me, let's put it back to the commanders. Now, for the commander and the functional community to work that out. But most from a headquarters standpoint, eight years is the magic number. Does that make right. sense? Yep, it does. Completely. I, I think I, I, I meant to say the same thing. So two long tours back to back. But I don't put that in the D-Rose Manager Policy. That's, that's in, that's in y'all's sauce mm -hmm. taken. I don't care about that. We don't right. have that. So it's all your policy. Mm -hmm. I have it. I have it. Like, I just, I didn't have it until probably two Chief, weeks Chief, you're not preventing from doing that. Multiple, multiple right. overseas, consecutive overseas tours. Yes, but they will say that, Jason, sometimes it's a remote. If you go to Kuntan, it's what, how many, how, what's, what's the time? I have a guy that stated it's it's like four years. It's 12 months, but typically what we'll say is, you, you're remote, you gotta go. <coughs> as far as I'm concerned, it is, it's, it's up to the commander. The commander deems that person the most, the other's most qualified based on performance. Okay. Not because of likability, yeah, performance. Okay. Then, you want them to stay, they can stay. But, now, the command now gets into eight years is it. You gotta go. Right? But there, I was told when we get with the chiefs that they're in the functional community, they can only do two tours for airmen, and then they have to come back stateside. They had that in the, the chief's handbook. And I think that recently has changed as well. Or I've got the chief, that's not a change. I'm talking about E8 and below. Yeah. We, we don't cover that in the chief's handbook, right? Correct, but um, E8 and below, they can do multiple consecutive overseas tours. Oh, good, okay, I'm, I'm good now. Yeah, I had, but I had an airman who tried to put an ex, like an extension to his his d rose because he wanted to stay in Korea. I mean, so, but then they wouldn't let him because they said that it was like two, like something about a back-to-back, -back. like he couldn't extend, he couldn't extend longer than what his tour was already. It was somewhere, something weird. It was probably before the philosophy. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like, like when, before the new It was a dumb philosophy. Out. I was like, he wants to stay in Korea. It was a two-tour limit. Yeah. And they were, they were not extending guys that were four years to a fifth year when they became command sponsor. Just, you know, you're on a two year and then a two year. You can't we're going we're gonna to support whatever, like you said, the commander de determines, the command chief, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the command leadership team, if they say that, we're going to support it. So you know, everything you said makes perfect sense to me, right? If, if, if it's performance based and they need to stay there for the mission, or the Chief Lindsay told the stories about retainability and DROS, or higher tenure extensions and all that kind of stuff, we're in the same boat. So just in quick, just based on our D-Rose management policy change, was just signed by General Brown, I'd ask y'all to read it. It gets to the point to where your airmen are in a position to where they want to stay, and you, as a part of the command team, feel it's appropriate, your commander support it, you support it, then elevate it. Elevate it to our A-1. It's not stopping at the wing, the commanders support it, but if you want it changed and get to the right point, commanders get a vote, send it to our A-1, it'll soon get to me. And from there, we'll look to support and do the right thing by you and your teams. Yes? Chief, uh, rely on your local FSS first. That's your link before you go to the MASCOM. Uh, but that's what the FSS at uh, your local base is there for. Well, hell, then, then, then that's included. You should rally through the chain and get it on up there. But don't stop it. No, don't stop. Because here it is. Some of you all will get caught up in your functional thing. Nope, don't believe that. This is it. You'll put your personal thought process and viewpoints on that. And, and to be honest, I don't care if you <laughs> skip FSS. Y'all are all mine. Thank you.
<laughs> well, what I'm saying is we should and be... I'm tracking all that, but yeah. sometimes you have stole pipes of excellence and there are timelines associated with it. Mm -hmm. There should be a web of communication team. Just because someone on your base, you can call it, call a, call a friend. You can do those things within the command. You can call your MAGCOM functional. You don't got to go to FSS first. You can call the next person on the side. That's what I'm have for every functional on the team. I said, if you were here on the, on the headquarters staff, you're not talking to other people outside of there, you're wrong. And so I'm getting, if you want advice, you know, there's always things as action to get a little bit more fidelity in your thing. Quit limiting people to say, you got to contact me first before you go somewhere else. That's BS. You want to get to it? Chiefs contact chiefs. Get a second opinion. Get a third opinion. You don't have to get action just then, but you can get that to get told the information. Imagine right now if y'all called me and said, what would be your advice to this? You'll get it real quick <laughs> when I get to the email. Bloop, here it is, and here's the thought process. But those are the things out there with it as well. Work them at your level, but sometimes at your level, man, it takes a long time to go from your squadron all the way up to a wing and then to get all the way up here to me. Whereas you do the chief network and you're talking to your chiefs, I'll get a phone call and probably you get it to about three, four days. That's usually by the time it takes you get to one of them CCMs and they say, well, I'm just give Tony a call. A good example of that would have been PME at um, PME at Osan and Kunsan. We're gonna shut it down. I got a phone call quick. Yeah. Just a thought, right? So don't get caught with stole pipes of excellence. I call folk all the time. I'll call right now to the wing level. I'm supposed to call them now first. No. I'll just say that. <laughs> I have a question on the EFMP stuff. Oh, um, tough we, one. I also get a lot of EFMP cases just because of how limited we are in our medical resources out there. And it just seems like with all the computer systems we have and data codability and things like that, it's almost a year basically. If someone gets turned off on EFMP before, you know, someone else is going to get the assignment that can't come up there. And God forbid, that person also has a disqualification. We, run, we go, I mean, Yep, so anytime that something happens where we remove somebody from the assignment, try not to talk bad about people. They should load another assignment right away. If that's not happening and they're not doing house cycle matches, you have to call. And I apologize for that already. But you have Chief Baxter's number, or if you know, like you say, you don't have to go straight through the Chiefs. You just call whichever function you want to and tell them. That we, sometimes we break stuff and don't know. So we're centralized manpower, which is terrible because that's, that's what we use, right? So that, that's what we need the most of. So we, we centralize and then we don't know what's happening at the squad. So if we break something or if the member, if something gets broken because somebody falls out, we need to know. And it's just because we're letting the cycles run sure. and maybe they got distracted by something else they don't understand. I guess my, I guess my complaint is, you know, with all the systems we have in place, why are they getting the assignment in the first place? Like this should, you know what I mean? Like this, this, this is a known issue. The hospitals have known limitations. Here's what we can't like, do. You know what I mean? Like, it's against the law for us to, to pick assignments or disqualify by a Q code, by a family member, because the you and everybody else has potential for development by the assignment, the officers especially. If we use that Q code as a discriminator, we might not allow somebody an opportunity. So we have to let it run that way, even if we know, right? Sometimes I, I've seen, there's a guy, at, if any guys are weapons, there's a guy at Osan right now who came from Nellis, and he knows he can't get a care anywhere else, but they, they, we, we, I own it. We gave him a, an assignment to another base. No one couldn't go there, just delayed everything just to send him back to notice. So it's, can I help answer that question as well? I know exactly what you're talking about. We've done a lot of homework on this and we fought yes. it. Some of the, unfortunately, APC mentality was, we can't do that because yeah. this reason, this reason, this reason. I go, uh, wrong. We can do it, and here's how we can do it. We do it just like we do to Korea. Yeah. Uh, young Airman goes into Korea, he's mentally disqualified, or whatever reason he can't go there, they do it in an automatic assignment and select. So we brought this up to Pitzelli, who unfortunately back into the building, um, and we, we've run some, some robot code, we continue to go back at that as well. We've appro approached the Q code piece of it as well, and we got the same answer, right? Yeah. For legality reasons, we can't do that. Yeah, which yeah. I'm okay with, as long as we can do the assignment reselect, as soon as we find out the person right. not medically cleared, to go in there, and we keep on approaching that. So we'll go back up there, and I'll, I'll provide some more da data as well. I just Here's, I feel like joint spouse. For joint spouse, people self-eliminate themselves just by what they choose. They want to PCS with their partner, not with their partner, that kind of thing. And basically by doing that, they automatically make the choice that they're going to be kind of limited on what they can get. And I don't know if that's an option to give out Q code people the same way and say, hey, is this something that you're willing to check the block and say, I'm not willing, you know, I'm willing to understand that 
you know, I can't go certain places because of this condition. Uh, and I so that's an idea that we haven't yeah. talked about right there. Like let somebody opt in to right. a disqualifier. Um, and, and the reason we know about that is because, so it's the other word, right? Like, like Hugh Cabal is right there now. So I got him. But um, so that so that's already been brought up. So that's a good that's a good example of communication. That's the reason I could answer that question and know what's not happening and know why you're not going to back this. If if we know about it, we just have to ask. If you if you want to, you can ask, and we, we're fixing the problem institutionally. But those are usually a little bit slow. Right, can I do her first? Uh, my question is so like to change the report to later than date, you can go into virtual monitors, all that, and automatically update it. But when I asked the question, and, and this just happened recently for me, so it's the only reason why I knew about it, I wanted to change my DROS. My chief's group assignment person said I had to go into virtual that leads you to my first to fill out that thing. I submitted it, went to both commanders, they approved, came back and said, it doesn't go to AFPC, I gotta go through the chief's group. So then I have to reach out to the chief's group again, what am I supposed to do? Then they say I have to do a DROS curtailment, memo, have to go through the wing, all this stuff. In fact, it went up to care. Thank you very much for pushing. Uh, why isn't everything just automatic through AFPC or through virtual? Like, because you, at the wing level, a lot of our frustration is how much everything gets kicked back because it's not written the way they want it. But then yesterday for the AFPC brief or the day prior, he had said, don't write it the way the AFI is telling you to communicate with you exactly what we need. But our wing isn't accepting that. I can write it to what you're saying, write it. But if I'm not writing it for the AFI, it's getting kicked back 20 times. So I feel like it would eliminate a lot of the frustration administratively if it was all automatically generated through virtual or my purse or whatever it is, instead of worrying about the formatting and what it is the wing wants. Because really, ultimately, we're <coughs> playing for our members, not just getting it as quickly as possible through the chain. Here, so we've thought about that. Here's my biggest, I hate this question every single time because the answer is terrible. Uh, our, um, our technology is retarded, meaning it's not like dumb, it's slowed way down, right? We can't, we can't develop things as fast as we want to. Um, there are, so I can give you the way ahead and I'm, I'm gonna tell you why first, but we can't develop the programs fast enough. So unfortunately, um, the negative pieces like no PDS, right? This, you talk about CMS, but no PDS is a little bit easier to talk about. Only, it's so detailed, only one company owns it and we can't change things in it very fast because they charge us a lot of money because they're a monopoly and they take their time. And that's kind of where we're at. So CMS and all those things are still, there's so many things we're trying to change to catch up because we're so far behind, uh, the Air Force is so far behind in, in our, uh, in, in what is it, IT, right? information technology. So we're so far behind that we, we can't catch up. So all those things, that might even be something that's in our queue, but our queue is, it's so long, I could, I don't even know if I could find it. And then to bump stuff up, what happens is the priorities, right? Not necessarily my priority or yours, it's gonna be the Air Force institution priorities where we re-rack and stack things all the time. Here's what we're doing and something that I missed out on and Chief Lindsay didn't hit real well. Um, that's the top marketplace piece. So everybody's been in Slickums now, right? Slickums is developed by BAMTech. BAMTech is developing talent marketplace for the officers. If you've ever sit next to an officer sometime and look at that, because that's what we're doing. That's that's another thing, another part of the enlisted style working group. We're gonna put that Kona cycle and that overseas cycle in <coughs> into talent marketplace. So you click around and it automatically does the BOP if you're a volunteer and you go back and step just like what we just did with Slickums. If you guys play in Slickums, it's gonna be very much the same, only with a pretty map. We just got that program, the Town Marketplace, to talk to Mill PDS, like it, to download into an Excel file and then update into Mill PDS, which is kind of a workaround. Um, hopefully, that doesn't get some kind of legal ramification soon, right? I don't know. Just knowing what the contract looks like with Mill PDS is bad. Um, but right now, we may have Town Marketplace able to update our preferences, update um, changes, and, and send. So it definitely can send emails to your functional. We just have to streamline that whole process. And, and the bottom line is why CMS jacked up because it uses the old AFPC office symbols. So it could go to DPAAD3, which is the assignment floor, but I'm policy, which is DP3 now. You can see the little, it's, there's not, that's the bad answer for it. So it's up and we can't fix it today. Keep in mind that too, CMS was originally uh, 
um, brought on because the uh, so just pay information only. Uh, when PC3 went down and uh, Milpids came yeah. up, it was, it was to take care of those issues. So we've taken CMS and we've exploded it. He's, he's right about the systems. And you know, we're talking about Milpids today, about sinking money into it. Oh, down the road in about two years, two and a half years, we're going to come out with Actives, which is the pay and personnel system as well. So I'm really surprised that we haven't sinking any money into the system as well. And it's a lot of money. Yes, sir. I want to clear up some uh, EFMP stuff, so, and correct me if I'm wrong okay. uh, when I say some stuff. So with EFMP codes, with Q codes, they're infinite in variation. So AFPC doesn't see that for HIPAA reasons, and then also because stuff is always changing with the member. So like, I'll give you myself as an example. I've been EFMP my whole career. I've had a Q code my whole career. When my son was little, he needed a lot of very huge surgeries. So I was kind of stuck in San Antonio for like five years. I'm still on a Q code. He's 19, about to go to college. All he, all he's on the Q code for is hearing aids, right? So AFPC can't see that. So what happens is, if I get hit up for an assignment, there has to be a clearance process that happens, and that sometimes takes time. And what that is, is the member is supposed to go to the FMP office, get the paperwork. It goes through the the provider, the head physician for the hospital signs off on that and says, you know what, we're cool with them leaving and going to that duty station. That gets sent over to that duty station, head physician of the hospital, looks at the capability currently at that moment of that hospital and that local civilian community, which by the way is always changing. That takes time. If at that moment they say no, then that's when it gets kicked back to AFPC, and then they have the determination to either send that member by themselves or to pull back the assignment and send someone else. The issue with just blanket saying no Q codes at this location is right. it's, it, it, it'd be against the law, it'd be unfair, because you don't know if the Q code is, hey, the child just needs a little bit of speech therapy. It, it comes out if it's yeah. family or the member. Right. Yeah. Sure. That's where the conversation that they have happens when it comes between you and your functionals and you kind of know those things. You can help clarify those things up front because they are limited on the HIPAA data that they get. The more senior you get, the easier it is because we know who you are. You've been around forever, right? We tend to know who you are. We can work those things in functional community. It's hard to do that when our airmen are very young and we're not connected with them and they're being generated by a system, one through the medical side and then through AFPC. Those are the challenges as we look at those right now. And we struggle with that in the command, definitely going into Allison, Masawa, and Korea. Those are the three hardest places to feel and we get a lot of pushback with the isolation and the tempo that's on there. I just, I'd like to offer one thing. As a mask on functional manager, what I tell all my base functional managers to do is to reach out. Once they know that Amazon is selected for an assignment, they get the inbound roster to contact them and see what their status is. I know that they're not going to share you all that personal information, but they can at least give you an insight on if they're on NFMP or they feel that there's going to be a potential that they will not be able to proceed. And, and the second part of it is when there is an assignment cancellation, you're going to get the real. I would say contact your mask on functional manager because they may not always be tracking it because the SG doesn't always send us the reasons when a member is denied. And so now that gives me the ability to be aware of it and then immediately I can contact AFPC assignment NCO so that we can get a reselect. And so I guess that's like the trade-off, right? On ensuring that, hey, uh, everyone's doing their part to ensure that you're fully prepared to continue to execute your mission. So don't forget, right, we can't talk, we can't discriminate based on that code. But there's no reason, don't for, so remember we work, AFPC, we work for somebody, which is you. So if you call up, don't let your functional not give you customer service, right? Just say, hey, I know I'm, my DROS is coming up, keep in mind I have this, and then just have a general conversation with you, right? They can't discriminate by, the, by that, but they can kind of give you a, they should be able to give you some customer service behind that. The last thing I'll say about Q codes, which is very important, it became evident at uh, Tyndall. People were avoiding getting their Q code updated at the hospital. If you get told to go to the EFMP coordinator, please do. Because we were having to reassign people that weren't at Tyndall and give them assignments and none of them had any paperwork. So uh, an astronomical number and percentage of those assignments out of there became EFMP assignments because we tried to assign them to a base that couldn't support their families. So make sure you go get that updated. It's not a negative thing. There's no discriminator besides that. You still get the same assignment opportunities, but we're able to take care of your family when we need to before you move versus while you're moving your office.
I think it's mandatory. Yeah, it is mandatory. You would say, yes, the U.S. <laughs> it is. It's just <laughs> supervisor involvement doing what's right. Everybody don't always do it, so you could. Okay. So you touched a little bit about the U.S. management, how that changed, and so now you can do up to eight years at one location, uh, whereas before it was a little bit different. We've also instituted a, a new process as well is that your airmen, you know, outside of their remote locations will receive the first air option rip at the 120 day mark at, of the data arrive station. So four months into that tour, they'll get their first air option rip, and then they'll still get a second bite at the apple 13 to 15 months prior to their deer sale. <coughs> the reason for that change is because one is we had a lot of guys coming out of tech school who weren't always necessarily able to capitalize on their, talent, their talents. Mm -hmm. So we spin them up in two years, uh, and then they, they get the prior level of dinner, they, Pop smoke and they roll out. Uh, so this is an, our opportunity during that sweet period to allow those guys to have the opportunity to extend. Sometimes we'll wait a little longer through promotions, through follow-ons, and other other assignment actions. Sometimes those airmen that want to apply for <coughs> extension aren't afforded those opportunities, or at least they're not approved because maybe humanity doesn't support. But if we give those guys the opportunity 120 days after data arrive station, most times Manning will support unless there's something out there. There'll be uh, some second, third order effects and we'll revisit this. But as of right now, uh, that policy just went into play and we'll revisit that policy one year after uh, it's been in play. So, yes sir. I have something on, on IPCOT, especially for these two year guys. Um, <coughs> so in VPC, there's, or, uh, there's no option for a decoration for an IPCOT. It's PCS, PCA, or achievement. <coughs> Are, are the three categories. Um, and so internally in our squad, our commanders made a decision that if we got a two year guy in the we're calling that an, an achievement. It's not. The assignment AFI says uh, IPCOT's a new tour, but it's not a PCS. I disagree with that, right? That comes down to the development of your people. Mm -hmm. I have to stand for this one. <laughs> I disagree with it. And so here it is. Some of y'all are cheating. You're trying to get over. A consecutive overseas tour or two tours. You should get one after the first two. If you're going for two years and you sign up for another two years, that's a two distinctive tours. And here it is. It's easy to do because it has inclusive dates. Now, that's easy for me to sell to any commander. Here's what's hard. An extension. I came in at 15, I'm going to, my tour ends in 17, and I want to extend it by one year. When do you give the decoration? At the two year or the one year? The tour. Look at all this conversation. It should be real simple. At the end of the tour. Not the, not the first two, not 15 to 17. That ain't in the tour. The member just elected to extend the tour, which means now it's an 18. So only all that's in here trying to help your airmen out when they come down to testing promotions, you're wrong. Oh, don't frown up. It's been done. I've been overseas for 15 consecutive years. Since 04, I've run across the whole gamut. Well, if we give him one right here to help him when he get ready to test, we can help Tony out here. No, wrong. Yeah. It's supposed to be done at the end of the tour. So if it's a consecutive overseas tour, and guess what? You do it then. You have another one. Then you get going. That's two. If you're going to give something else in between that time frame, right? I'm the command chief at uh, Aviano. In the middle of the tour, three-year tour, I brought a man. I said, I want your absolute best airman to come in here and work in XP, to work in these other programs, and I'll take care of them. They're doing a fantastic job. That's a specific achievement. Mm -hmm. And they'll have specific inclusive dates that you're doing that took us a minimum of a year, and you're going from here. And just because you came in, you're a master sergeant, doesn't mean you're going to get an MSM. You're about going to get a, a, an achievement. That's good. It's a, it's, a, it's a specific achievement or accommodation. You're not getting what someone's going to get for a full tour. I didn't do that. It didn't make sense to me. Right? And so it's different things you're looking at decorations. But going back to the 120, I'm finding resistance on this. The 120 days gives your command an opportunity. So here's some of my thoughts on why I think it's genius. I, of course, I think so. But I have not provided you the rationale on how I look at it. 
how we look at it. What I'm talking about right now, 120 days, imagine the airman just coming in, 120 days, he's at your assignment, they arrive. And this airman says, I want to stay, sign me up. That can speak to, guess what? Two things in your organization. What do you think? Climate and culture of the organization. Let's say you just had 15 of your airmen, 10 of them said, I don't want nothing to do with this place. It stinks, I want to go. <laughs> what indication does it tell you right now as a chief? You might want to get out here and you don't need to do deox. That's immediate, that is immediate feedback. And not once are we looking at the data to look at that to provide insight to what's going inside your unit outside of your purview. Because you're not the sergeant they're dealing with every day. They're dealing with one at E5. Keep in mind, and E5 is the most junior, most inexperienced airmen we have in the supervisor ranks, and we want them to do and make decisions as we would. They're not doing it, and so they need help, and so that's some of the impact and results you can see. It gives instant gratification to the climate and culture of the organization. At 120 days, G. Karras also said you will also still receive that other option at RIP at the other end, on the back side of it. If an airman decided that at 120 days I want to stay, could you turn that thing off potentially at the end? If they what? If they didn't enter it. If they didn't enter it. 15, 18 months, they ain't entered it yet. Right? But could you turn it off? Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they haven't entered it yet. No. It's not, I don't want to say that. That's a simple answer. Don't you give it to me, Jason. Shit. <laughs> it's not because they haven't entered it yet. They haven't maybe, maybe they're not performing at the level they need to. Oh. Music to my ears. <laughs> but what I have now you have, have something. Have, if they haven't performed, if they haven't earned that by performance, you need to do something else about it. Don't send them stateside and let someone else go. No, no, no. no ain't nothing wrong with average performance. <laughs> Get off of it, Chief. Well, we we keep, need average. Then why do we keep? Then what I'm saying, you off? know what you're getting. Ain't nothing wrong with someone doing a consecutive overseas tour be average. Maybe you might get outstanding. Well, that was my point. Why would we turn it off? What I'm getting at, I don't know what the case may be. We'll Typically, up. let's talk about the process. Don't fuss <laughs> with me, Mike. You stepping on my innovation. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing me already. <laughs> no. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm being. I'm drop. Uh, this is an over dramatization. Small <laughs> part. <right here. laughs> Right? So over dramatization, what you, <laughs> what you end up happening is, what's the normal process? Here's what happens. We get a sheet of paper. It comes through, oh, tension, blah, blah, blah. Senior Airman Johnson, blah, 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 gets ready to do an extension. Man, yeah, I want to stay. Yep, two years. It goes to the supervisor. Oh, okay, I guess we'll route that up. Then it hits this next person. We get ready to go this thing right here. Who really looks at it? When is the EPR pool? When are we looking at feedbacks? When have we done any of that? And y'all in the theater, you doing it? Oh, of course. Yes, I'm here. BS. I didn't do it that way. I'm going to talk from my experience. I didn't want to go pull all those things. I thought it was going to be done. Here it is. She's doing it now. She's a chief. Ain't nobody trying to hear that shit when she was a staff shot and she didn't do it because no one trained me to do that. My assumption as a frontline supervisor is that was being done by the first sergeant and the command team of the commander. You are part of the command team. No one helped me with this. It ain't no rule book nowhere. I don't hear that shit talking about you did it. You didn't do it at staff sergeant. If you, if you were, you might be one of these 14, 15 guys. I didn't have that experience. And that's what we're doing at Airmen now. So now at 120, you now have an indicator for culture, climate of the organization. You now have an opportunity to drive frontline supervisor feedback and development. Johnson wants to stay. Have you talked to him, Technical Sergeant Marquez? No, I ain't talked to Airman Johnson. You better go have a conversation with him. Let him know the impact of him staying in these things in a continual overseas environment. When's the last time he went home on leave? I don't know. Does he have any family issues and things we need to know? Now some personal stuff is going on. Now we can look at performance. Is he really outstanding? Is he he? Is Johnson who we want to be and keep overseas or we now can turn him or her back and get someone else new into the organization? You can do a lot with knowing who's supposed to be there and really look at it because it's a privilege, not an automatic right. And the discernment starts with us, team, so when are we doing it? Boy, some great talking points at 120 days and potentially turning off 
at the end, if appropriate, not mandatory. But I also say this thing when we're serving over here, what if the member gets married? <clears throat> mm, sofa status. And all the other things that come with it. 15 years overseas. Nobody talking about to me about this. The only time I've ever seen somebody have to go talk to somebody, and it was written by an AFI. You need to go talk to the first son before you get married. Oh, sign this paper. How long you been dating? Three days, but sign it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, I'm leaving. Love, she loves me. <laughs> right? And that's it. I've not seen much of these type of things, and it just lends to the potential of driving face-to-face -face communication from immediate supervisor through the commander. And those are some of the things we look at the, with the 120, if that makes sense. Now, just as Jason is, we're going to tweak this thing with your feedback. But I don't need y'all not to make a say, because again, we fuss and cuss and discuss as I'm telling you right now, at the headquarters, woo, all the time. I'm like with Chief White, we've thought about it. <laughs> yes, we've thought about it. We cuss and discuss these things all the time. What I have to do better, this is, this is your chief's responsibility, and I failed in doing it. It's really communicating the why. So I'm going to do talking points and put it in the form of a tag. I'm going to send it to the command. We're going to work on that next week. This way you'll have the talk and say, why are we doing this 120? You can do it without the over dramatization and the small font on the bottom. And you can just tell your airmen, here's some things we're looking at. Culture, climate, frontline communication and development of our airmen, making sure that we can discern performance and recognize and really it's a privilege honor to serve an overseas environment. And if not, the right airmen, then we can send them back based on commander's intent and what our commander believes. Break, break. Then we can talk about those things inside of commander's calls alike our senior seal contact points and drive home. Here's what we're doing right now to make sure we have the right airmen still serving based on the training, education, and development in this AOR. We need you for a little bit more continuity. We have those tools and things in place <coughs> because we vetted you, we've talked to you, and developed you. Fantastic. Okay. She's a mean little thing. At <laughs> what point do you turn it off? Right. Like, I mean, like, what did you say? What, what was the month? Like, if they're if they have not entered uh, their extension. Okay. And, that, that, and if you curtail that extension or cancel that uh, extension, and they don't go into an assignment, so we'll have to cancel that extension. So, obligor, they get again a second time at the 13th. 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13. Correct. That's when you'll see it automatically come back and down again in the commit. Make sure that airman is still in the air. Are you sure you are want you to keep sure? this? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's when it comes again. Yes, sir. Is After there, this, we get ready to hit a break. Has there been any thought of have you thought about <laughs> yes. the remote locations? Because I get I get guys all the time come to me and say, I'm in Korea, I'm in Osan. It was designed for with Korea in mind. Because they, they get there and you know, yeah. sixty days after they have to make a decision. Yeah. And then one twenty they're like, Sir, I want to stay. Too bad. Yeah. You're, you're going to It was designed for they it was it was designed for them. And and actually the D Rose management policy led as well. That's why remotes, COTs, IPCOTs, all that stuff was removed from the previous policy and not placed in this one. All this one says now is eight years, one location. And again, if you feel that a person should stay, you can do that from a commander. That one is with the functional community. Can I miss something that you said? Yeah. Boy. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm those, saying those, right those, now, if you get those, towards those. there, you'll still have, they say, 120, I want to go here. Again, typically, it comes out a little sooner in a remote time frame. But there's another option that still gets the airmen in there. If, if it pops up in here, we'll look at that. I, I'm off on the days for the remotes. You're but, right. Yeah, we're actually working on that. So when I go down the APC, it's one of the things we're going to work at because we want to try to extend that chief when there's a 120-day mark. But right now, we can't because most people going to Korea get their sign about nine months prior to. Correct. Okay. So, so what do you, well, about 120 days is about perfect in, in reality for Korea because we get it. Right now, we get it at 60 days. It typically is not for those that have assignments, right? If you come in with an assignment already, then you automatically are good to go. It's those sure. that come without assignments. Right. We're trying to drill down with APC now on why our airmen are coming without assignments. So we're doing homework on that as well, right? Uh, and so for you all, the ones that, that, that come to Korea without them, we're, we're looking at that. And there are a lot of reasons why some don't. It's because everybody wants to go to Florida, Texas, or California. It's, some areas are just overfilled just simply by where they are because of the top locations. And we're trying to determine and work on that as well, all right? Uh, okay, we'll get to, we'll do this one and we'll take a break and we'll take you all up when we come back. How soon before that one point rolls out? That's done. It's already been through. It's already out. I can say I'm watching it. So, but, um, so what did you say about like, the whole assignment thing, like not having assignment at all? What about the ones who left and did have assignment, but they don't have enough retainability to cover 
that assignment to even go for that year, and now they get pushed to their ETS. Yeah. Okay. Like, why haven't they extended or re-enlisted prior to coming to Korea, and then all and, of a sudden? And, and typically, that's what they. That's why uh, they push the ETS because they have not done that. And I don't but, know what. But, made them but the, not do the, it. the base that they're PCSing from didn't take care of it, I and so they you. get to Osan, yes. and now they're like, "What well, the hell? I just lost my assignment, and you know." Correct. Correct. Go ahead. I'll, I'll speak to you at one on one so we get these guys out okay. of here. Okay. All right. Uh, 25, 15, 40 after. So, uh, so I'll stand in the back, uh, answer any questions that you guys may have. Um, so I can answer. If I don't get a chance to get to you or you can't get to me, uh, shoot me an email real quick or give me a call. I'll help you guys out. You know, My, my big thing is, is that we work from you guys. And if we're not taking care of you guys, we're not taking care of those airmen. So uh, that's the way we, we do business up there at PACAC is we look at it as, as if we work for you guys. So we're here to take care of you. Uh, a couple of things I do want to talk about uh, based on some of the discussions and some of the things I've seen recently uh, from some of our Comanches and throughout the bases is our DSD program. Mm. Something I seen last night was uh, a request to take a person out of a DSD program or assignment, take them off the assignment because the person potentially has some family issues. So here's what I would ask you. It should never have gotten to me, the request that should never have gotten to that point is before you vector any of your folks, sit down and do interviews with those folks. Amber Cares, I'm, I'm thinking about vectoring you for these uh, positions. Uh, what are your thoughts? Here's what the job entails. If you don't know what the job entails, then reach out to some of those keys on that installation or up at the management and ask them about those questions. So I, I would ask that. The other thing I would ask as well is as a senior enlisted leader on your installation, Know what your local higher priorities are, which ones are coming vacant or not, and start identifying some of those, those individuals on your installation who would be a great fit for that. So when these requirements come out, you're, you're ready to execute. The third thing I'd ask you guys to do is that uh, understand what the requirements are for the big Air Force. You may not know the exact numbers, but know what the AFSCs are and identify those key performers in your, your squadrons. And so when that requirement comes out, we can push it forward. You know, with the help of Chief Johnson, what we've done is uh, we get 30 days to get through all that stuff. We give you guys three weeks of those, uh, those four weeks that we get. That last week is I'm not receiving all those rosters. I do a surf on each one of those individuals. And sometimes that's what upwards to three to four hundred people that I'm surfing up, each individual one uh, to identify as a qualified or not. We find some people that are disqualified for various reasons, but I would ask you guys to uh, do your part at your end so that when it does get up here, uh, we're good to go. Because ultimately what we do at the end of the day, or at the end of the DSC, is we do a report card. That report card goes to Chief Johnson. I, I don't know everything Chief Johnson talks about, but I do know one thing. Everything that comes across his desk, he's going here and talking to his boss about. So if he's taking bad news into his boss, that's a direct reflection on you and your installation. So help us help you guys on that, that particular part and do those interviews and identify what those, uh, those requirements are. Evaluations. So Big Air Force standard is uh, 60 days into the records after the sky. Here's what we do in the command. At the 70 day mark, any EPR that's not done, we provide a by name request, uh, by name roster up to uh, Chief Johnson, who then again walks it in to come back at. Now, the uh, wing command is in uh, some of our 06s, uh, I think we have to 07s, but that's not a good thing for the, the four star C that uh, Anderson has 20 people on this roster. And oh, by the way, these individuals may not get promotional consideration in cycle. So help us help you guys again by getting those EPRs in. We get a 120-day notification prior to the SCOD of who's, who's the EPR. We get an additional 60 days after the SCOD to make sure that those EPRs are done. Chief Johnson is nice enough to give additional 15 days. So help us out by getting those reports in because, trust me, it is a lot of time to track that information. Um, as far as the track purposes go, it, it, it literally can take up to a day to track all that information, and we do it on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, if anybody's at the Kadena, uh, he's got one of the better programs out there. For the practice. best in the, pro in the in the command. Largest wing we have, largest combat wing in the Air Force. The best, on time, 100%, before the 60 day pass. Woohoo! Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> and you wonder why, how does that happen? One of the biggest bases in the command? Two us. At the day 31, after the sky, that unit commander has to stand up for the wing commander and explain why that report is late. So, some of you all ask right now why we can't do it otherwise. Control what you can. What you can do is make sure that your members and your squad are not late. As Wing Command Chief, I didn't ask for not one EPR. I changed my philosophy on it. 
I didn't ask about that. One EPR 30 days ahead of time. Why? You looking like, you really serious? At the wing, it didn't. I didn't ask for one EPR 30 days ahead of time. AFI says it should be submitted on time. On time after that, from the wing, once we get to review it through everything else, I got 60 to 45 days. 45 days to review it. But quality product is coming in. I ain't got to do many edits. Mm. Quality product. That means they got those spelling errors. We did some work. We did some quality to it. It's good to go. And so once we change the philosophy on that, had some weekend sessions, it's good. How many of y'all think overtime is not authorized? <laughs> you kill a four-day weekend, everybody come in, you get a whole lot of stuff done. Mm -hmm. No one goes home until it's done. You have that authority right now. <coughs> Use it. Quit running around and trying to be the Airman's champion. Hello. You can be their champion when they records are on time. I'll be amazed right now if I could do this. Pop in your wing, your insulation, and everybody that you got late, put them all in the room. You say, why am I here? <coughs> all the folk whose EPRs are late and they just want to talk to you. What would you say then? You own it. Overtime is authorized. It's easy. You ain't got to go home on Saturday. You can come right on in. You can wear PJs if you want. It can be a pajama day. You can put a movie on the big TV. You can bring in pumpkin pie. It's good. I say that jokingly. But at the end of the day, it's amazing how we can go on leave. We can take time weekends. We can go four day weekends. And the thing that impacts careers, the most critical thing, <coughs> is done. And if I could change it right here to so it's time for you to PCS and get gone, I bet your stuff's submitted. I bet your junk is done in no time. But we don't hold our members to the same type of accountability. He's asking you to be accountable to them. Do it and get after it. That's a tough one. Kadena Air Base. Why you can't do it in staff meeting in your own staff meeting? You ain't got to go to the wing. Control yours. Have them senior sales come in there and say, hey, Son River, you got 16 reports. Tell us why they late. Run down the list. Tell them before staff meeting come next week, we're going to have next month. Well, when the static close out today, what's the next one for March for Aaron? Go right back. On, on the 31st of March, we're not going to have all the supervisors come in and report to the commander why they're late. You can fix that in your own heart. I, I guarantee you, you put a pass like that, folks will get to move. Do what? You'd be amazed how many of your outstanding, your perceptions, perception, your PN and NPs pop in there. I thought Johnson was good. He shit. He in here briefing his people. He, of course. I guess he ain't that good. You might not be a PN and MP next round. Didn't he come in here on the staff sergeant and the CM and Scott? I don't think he got good time management. Why y'all think he's so good? He's crappy. He don't get my vote. I do not advocate for him. I don't know if that's what I would do or not. It just sounds good. <laughs> Chief, over dramatization. <laughs> All right. I'm just saying, I like it, it's good. Okay, PJ, I'm sorry. <laughs> I like to call him Chief uh, Denzel Washington. Get out of here, man. Denzel, <laughs> uh, Chief Cheeks is another one. Yeah, one. The, um, <laughs> hey guys, well, one of the things I would recommend, uh, and we looked at the uh, OSINs uh, security forces process because they did just what Chief Johnson said. Those guys were late on a lot of the reports and they brought all those folks in like three, four o'clock in the morning. So we went over there, we did a CPI event under the process, and we eliminated a lot of steps. As you go through any process to deal with, whether in your job or, or in the personnel world, is always think about how you can improve it and get rid of the, the wasted steps in there. Uh, streamline things as best as possible, because our manning isn't gonna get, get any better. Um, it's probably only gonna go down, or if you think you need manning, uh, it may go out to some other locations, whatnot. But uh, always look for uh, ways to have innovative processes and uh, streamline them as well. Yeah. The other thing I want to talk about with evals is make sure you're sitting down with your folks so, so that they understand the enlisted force distribution process as well. Because uh, as we did the uh, Pacific Strike briefing with those guys, I was asking those guys, hey, you know, how much you guys know about this? 
frankly, they didn't. They didn't know anything about that or the DSP program. So I highly encourage you guys to sit down with those guys and provide that transparency so they fully understand. Here's the other thing I'd ask. You know, sit down with your grand chiefs and ask the question, why can't some of your young airmen sit up there, as long as they're not promotion eligible or you know, the same grade, why can't they go up there during the FTP process and be reporters? Because I tell you what, there's nothing better than one of those, those airmen out there talking about the program and how it's run. It gives a lot of credibility to that process, and a lot of credibility to those leaders that push those folks forward. I think the most important thing is that they get a chance to hear what the wing commanders talked about and the other commanders on, on that base, so other things of big value as well. The uh, couple of the pack up initiatives that we have going on right now, some things that we're working with, or working towards is, right now our, our retraining program for our first year of airmen, they can only apply for retraining within their dearest window. So sometimes that dearest window doesn't always align up to allow those guys to uh, be eligible for a retraining <coughs> program. A uh, case in scenario that we have over in our A1 community is that the young lady has a dearest of uh, February of 20, and uh, the class dates don't come out for fiscal year 20 until July, August, perhaps even September. And so today she's not eligible because those class dates are out there. So what we have is our career assistance advisors encouraging Jarvis extensions. Well, in this case, the Jarvis extension is not going to be approved because many doesn't support it. So we work with AFPC. We, we flip the idea over to USAP as well. Say, how can we change this to give these guys the opportunities that our recruiters promise them? And give them those opportunities to, to retrain. But also, it's a great way to rebalance our force as well and make sure we have the right numbers in the AFPCs and, and rebalance those and make sure that those FCs that are over 100% are rebalanced down to closer to 100%. We'll couple that program or that initiative as well with our selective reenlistment program as well. Because oftentimes when you have to retrain, you have to get that attainability as well. And if it's retraining into an SRB and FC, uh, they don't always get that opportunity to get that SRB. So we're trying to look at some changes um, with that program as well. Uh, something our FC friend had talked about was the, the follow-on program. Uh, we're also looking at expanding the, the CAPE window. I want to couple those together because I, I do believe, and I don't have any data here to support me, but and we're doing some data mining, is that uh, right now, commanders in the field are asking for the CAPE window to be extended from to 120 days. So you're right, you get the, uh, the first chop at it when, before, or, excuse me, when you get your assignment at your losing base, you get another chop at it when you get to Osan or, or Kunsan, and then you get another chop at it with your Jiro's option rail. But really, sometimes that's not enough opportunity for those commanders to assess if this is the person I really want to keep on the ground for an additional tour. So we're trying to expand that to a 120-day window. But quite honestly, there's some things backed up in the assignment system that may not allow us to do that. So how do you get around that? To decentivize the PK program? Because that is to maybe bolster our follow-on program so that airmen, if they've got a follow-on that they want, they're not likely to take the CAPE program. Uh, so we're looking at some of those things. We'll work with the FTC later this month. Uh, to see how we can better improve that program. Uh, and possibly, uh, maybe get some transparency to that those people who apply for a follow-on don't get their follow-on, and we say, I just play off the equal the equal system. Why can't we not say, hey, that assignment isn't available, that location is available, but here's some other options for you. Or perhaps maybe we uh, allow those guys to apply for a follow-on closer to the time you're getting ready to get your, uh, your PCS orders. So a few things we'll look at as well. Yes, ma'am. One more question. Uh -oh. uh, so go back to the <coughs> to get a follow on and these members PCS and they arrive in Korea and now they don't have and they arrive without the attainability to even go to their follow on. So where is that foul happening? Because I I thought that they had to have that stuff done prior to PCSing and then they get to Osan and then they end up losing their assignment because now they got extended to their bureaus. Um, or what have you, because they didn't have the retainability to get that assignment. Yeah. So what's supposed to happen, and it's on the losing base, is that Johnny gets an assignment to you know, Korea, and Johnny flies for a follow on to Little Rock, and he gets to Little Rock, um, but he doesn't have uh, 12 months retainability beyond the Korea assignment. Within 30 days of those guys getting that follow on assignment, they're supposed to get the retainability, and if they don't, there's uh, the MPF is supposed to send a message up to AFPC to say, hey, cancel my assignment, and get back to the retainability. They should be also following that up with a declination statement to the 964 to say that a member has declined the uh, retainability. Now, in this particular case, you know, sometimes we don't always do a great job of reading what airmen should do, but we're really good about telling airmen what they can't do. Uh, so I would tell you this, let us know those situations, and let, let's look at the situation that, you know, the circumstances that arrive um, to get us to this point. Let's take a look at that and go back up to the FPC. 
I'll tell you, uh, Sergeant Wright, I give his, uh, his office hell, whether he realizes it or not, but we push hard on, push hard on a lot of things. One case that we had uh, last week, a young man over in Korea, um, he, uh, he got an assignment after the higher tenure was extended, uh, he's a tech sergeant, to 22 years. His dearest was November of last year, he still had not PCS, his data right, or his uh, EOS was July. And uh, so I said, hey, the right thing to do is let this member to retire. That's what he wants to do. He applied for it, uh, but because the eligibility check got delayed, he was able to do And I said, hey, ACC, AFPC, let's let this guy uh, retire and get out of here. Nope, nope, nope. I go, okay, AFPC, that's fine. If that's the way you want to roll with this, then uh, approve the extension of policy so this member doesn't have to do retainability. Because here's what's going to happen. The guy's going to help process in February or March now. Mm -hmm. He's going to get there. <coughs> He's going to get his uh, household goods. And then he's going to pop into work, he's going to do his personal TY paperwork, he's going to do his terminal leave paperwork, and he's retired. Is that really what you want? Well, we'll just relook at this, give another guy in time at that location, and let's press forward. It took a little bit to get us to that point, but, you know, push hard enough and use some common sense growth, we got there. So, we'll look at it. Um, and, and, but then also, you know, that we have a lot of the automated emails that say, hey, you need to get this. So, yeah, people sometimes are getting those emails even before their email boxes are sometimes set up. You know, we don't have any freaking memory in our inboxes, so they get an overload, like if they're on missions or whatever, so then their mailbox fills up. So they're like, well, we sent an email. You were supposed to apply for whatever. Um, how do we fix it? Because if there is a kickback of the email, like it did not reach the member, who's monitoring that? And so they're saying that they sent it. Yeah, sure, APC sent this email. But, um, yeah. So I'll get to it before Chief Johnson does, because I know he's going to have a different spin on it. And mm -hmm. He gets passionate about this. So let me, I'll roll back just a little bit. As an FSS superintendent or an MPF, here's what I used to say. I, I go down to an MPF and I say, why are you sending me 10 documents with 10 pages each? I'm not going to read that shit. I just, I, and quite honestly, I don't understand it. So now we send it out to the guys on the flight lines, the, the security forces guys. So I tell our guys, I said, take your show on the road. Go out there and see those guys. Uh, being at Masawa, it, it was very clear to us that we were doing a very good job of supporting our maintainers out there in the flight line. They were working 12, 14, 16 hours a day, and they're not going to, you know, after work, go into their emails. So I said, Let's, how do we change our process to better benefit those guys? Once we've shown we've done everything we can do, now it's truly on the squad and squad leadership to take uh, additional actions. But I, I say, uh, get the show on the road, get these guys out there, uh, do the briefings if they have to, to the squad, whatever. If, they, if they're on a post, go out there and see the guys post. You know, we don't have to just send emails or sit behind the desk and from 7.30 to 4.30 and expect our airmen to do things. Uh, I'll tell you. Here's what uh, our friend here will tell you. Where's the leadership? Where's the supervisors? Why aren't they involved? Why don't they know those things? That sounded well, just like him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, of, of, of those emails, though, when <clears throat> the FSS standpoint, we just don't send the email just to the member. Yeah. We include their first sergeant, because we know those units that, that become a problem. Mm -hmm. So we just don't rely on that person. We, we do the first part, and we might include the superintendent of that unit. So that way, everybody's aware. Yeah, but it's still not getting down to the people that it needs to get to. I, Who else we... we, we, we I, I'll tell you. Or you got that, but that's under the assumption that with the high turnover at Osan, at least, I'm not uh, speaking for Osan, yeah. that you have the right names, because Nobody's PCS and it's going to the right people. That so, so you can solve this by going tit for tat. There's a thing called a chief's group meeting. There's a thing to call a chief assignment or a, a chief email. You can send one to each other. This is where it comes down to this week is it where is the active involvement and engagement on the squadron chief and first sergeant? Right? I don't, I don't know where y'all are at. I'm confused. Because I was at your wing, you had to come see me. You should demand excellence of everyone. If your FSS superintendent or MPF is not doing that, do an office call. Here's my problem. That's why he gets it. At, he, he, I said, why aren't they asking for the support? Why aren't we asking for this? It's there. Communicate. It's amazing. Y'all get fired up with the most simplest of things. When they come out taking care of Amber doing this, we are lost. So all I ask is, is communicate with your peers across the board, and you can solve a lot of these things. It may not necessarily be a chief's group. There are operational meetings that you all have. Most of you all meet within your own groups. There's a group superintendent meeting. They bring the chiefs and squadron commanders up. That would be an opportunity for you to fix and solve some of those things, too. 
All it takes is a willing willingness to get after it. And from there, you can solve these things no problem. Once you hear it, and I'll tell you what, if you're in a meeting and you hear it being done over in maintenance, you hear it over security force overseas, you might want to look inside your own house. Nine to, uh, six times out of 10, you may be experiencing the same issues, it just ain't made it to your level yet. But the more important you get out of the gate, you'll start to see those things. So the bottom line is, there's more than one way of getting mm -hmm. things done, uh, whether it's through chief's meetings, whether it's through phone calls, <coughs> uh, but it's quite all, all your opportunities. <coughs> Last thing I'll talk to you a little bit about, and this requires OSD approval, it's something we're trying to get after, and it requires the support of the other services on in Japan, and that's the tour lane. Uh, so try and change the unaccompanied tour lane to three years, like what you see in Alaska and Hawaii. But I would really believe that that's gonna give it back to uh, getting after compact at priorities of posturing for the future, resiliency, and uh, readiness as well. So that's the last thing that we're, we're trying to get after as well. It's, it's easier said than done because it requires the other components to get on board, but also it requires the COCOM to drive that requirement down, or the request down to the, um, to the NAFs. Uh, and the other partners over there as well, from the other services. And uh, then they do some data gathering, then it goes back up, supported by the COCOM and the OSD for, for final approval. So uh, we're trying to get after that. I don't know how much success we're gonna have, but if we can't get that, uh, that done, then we'll look at some other initiatives as well to see how we can uh, uh, entertain a uh, army on the stand at those insults before we want to So any questions for me before I turn it over to Chief Johnson? Like I said, if, uh, if not, whatever, I'll stand in the back after we get done here and entertain any of your guys' questions. And if you guys can't get back to me, then uh, shoot me an email, give me a phone call. Thank you, guys. All right, so I won't be as long on my farewell because we're still serving in the command. Again, I'll go back into the same things I talked about earlier today. A lot of initiatives I talked to you about readiness of our airmen, develop, readiness of the force, development of our airmen, inclusion of families. Those things will work no matter where you go, what command you sit in. We also talked about some of the tools that you provided uh, today as well, and looking at things that you can do when you go from one unit to the other when it's talking about readiness. I'm gonna always center on those things uh, and really look at how we can take care of the mission first, the mission, and then look at how we can take care of our airmen and families uh, inside of it. And I think that's a focal point and really where you should be centered as chiefs inside of your organizations, no matter what level that you're working at, right? And so if General Brown were here today, he would say thank you for your leadership. But he also would say this, I don't work, uh, you don't work for me, I work for you. General Brown concludes every session that he has by saying that. And he says the heart of that he is is because he's looking for things to take on, barriers, communication, anything that you may have that will get in front or prevent productivity of taking care of the mission or the job. He's willing to take it on. And so with that, we'll stand by a little bit later at the end. And if things that are really troubling or getting after or preventing you from doing that, we'll take it on and we'll follow up with you. That's our obligation and what we owe you. We are your command team. This is it. At the end of the day, if we can take care of you, we know our airmen will get after the mission sets that we have, no matter where it is. If it's OSD, we have a COCOM. We'll work those things through Admiral Harris and we'll uh, Admiral <coughs> Davidson. I mean, we're through Admiral Davidson, and then we'll go right on up and we'll take care of that. We're trying to be plugged in at all levels uh, that have us, whether COCOM or have, and get after those issues. At the end of the week. At the end of the day, this has been a positive week, and more importantly, it's been about taking care of you all. And so I really hope that you look and reflect as you get ready to go back to your duty stations in the Pacific, which we'll hopefully get back by this weekend, right? Before Monday. Y'all should all be back by Monday. She's doing leave. As you get back, hopefully reflect over the notes that you've taken. Some of the uh, conversations that you had when you sat down and just hung out and, and thought about the peers uh, and, and relationships that you will start mm -hmm. while you're here. More importantly, we look at this breakout, I hope that you think that uh, and know that we have your best interest at home. But we can't solve or really get after anything without your feedback. The one thing I also share with my chiefs is this. I cannot provide good guidance and feedback to the boss without your voice. Never forget where you come from. Another phrase I, I have is all of these stripes, chevrons, and we've lost our voice. Don't lose your voice to communicate on the behalf of your airmen. We're counting on you. If anyone else in the unit can tell us what we need, how we need to do it, 
or how well we're doing, it's you. Too often I always talk about the bad stuff. Oh, this is something that's preventing me. We'll get on those. But I also want to know of your successes. No better way to champion our airmen than you recognizing them. And that's something I don't do well. I don't do as often. And I, I, I can be better at that. I have a team that keeps me uh, uh, grounded in Sergeant Irons, Chief Harris, uh, uh, but Chief Hodges, and others will say, hey, Chief, this is an outstanding airman. They're doing great things. You'd be amazed. I'll say, hey, if there's an airman you need me to recognize in the command, the headquarters, or whatever else, let me know. I'll come around, coin, thank them, do public praise, whatever the case may be. Nothing. But soon as I, I'll get a lot of problems. But in problems, I need you to, I need to generate solutions because that's what we do as a command team. We generate solutions. I also ask that you sit often with your teams. That is the best way to stay connected with your people. Put it on your calendar and make it a routine battle rhythm. When do you do it? I sit with my team at the headquarters every two weeks. And when I'm not there, I create a different, form, a different format than my predecessor. He is the superintendent of the headquarters. He's my number two. When I'm not there, there's something that goes on. I don't care what other chief, you know, it, it doesn't matter. He's it. By virtue of his position as the MAGCOM function and being a first sergeant, is a distinguished chevron. He sits and he leaves that form of chiefs and the directors and those alike. That's part of my normal battle rhythm. What's yours and who do you sit with? We write a lot. We take down all the notes. I need you to share your thoughts with your teams. When do you sit back and reflect on leadership above and peer and share? Here's where we're going. Understand your commander's priorities. Our boss, be ready, resilient, posture for the future. General Brown, mine, I've just given to you. What are yours? What things are you getting after in your unit that support your commander's intent? A success or uh, 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 something that can help you with success. <clears throat> understand your commander's intent, understand their guidance, their feedback, what they desire. How do you do that? I sit with my boss every day between 1500 and 1630, we call it an admin sink. And when I go in, my spot is, if we had his desk right here, he would sit in the middle of the table, no one really sits at the end, and I sit right on the end, that's my spot, that's my desert, that's my seat. Nobody really sits in, they just know the chief sits there. And the captain, actually, the captain sits here, I think the keg or something sits on that end, and then everybody kind of feels in it. The other geos on that side, but I'm, that's, that's my seat, now I'm running the corner. And he goes around and he says, what do you got, chief? When I talked earlier about transparency, when I talked about how effective you are, another way to look at efficiency is again your calendars. I talk about, here's what I'm working on. He'll say, so what do you got? What do you tell the general? What do you tell your commander? Hey, chief, what you got? What, what's going on with you? Oh, just chief business. Is that it? You might, you, you might lose some credibility. So I walk down and I say, sir, I'm working on an initiative right now that's impacting the command on some of the things that uh, our airmen on first-time assignments. They can't uh, uh, look at D or retraining opportunities. I'll tell them that. I'll say, hey, Jason, let's put up a talking paper. Let's get with AFPC. Let's follow up on this one. I'm working on a pet policy in Guam and how we can get pets there and defer costs. Shit's killing me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working another one in Guam on how we can increase or possibly put a Patriot Express in there. Oh, it's killing me. It's not necessarily killing me. I ain't signed there. But it's important to the airman and the command, so it's a priority for me. If it's important to your airman, it's important to you. You need to know when to champion those things. That's one I'm, I'm working right now on behalf of the command. And it has my uh, sense of urgency. I'm working with Chief Green on it from AMC. We're also working with Chief Branch at Transcom. I'm also working with Sergeant Major Spadaro at Indo Paycom. I share those things on what I'm working Because I hope I have the trust and confidence of my boss. When I'm not there, who fills in for me? Who do y'all think? <coughs> no, Chief Hodges don't come up because he don't really know exactly what I'm doing every day. He fills in the other little stuff. Who, who, who fills in for me? You, you can help. You can go. <coughs> my exec goes. She knows everything I'm doing. Although he has access to my calendar, she can speak every everything I'm doing. So my eyes goes and sits in my seat. And because of trust and comes to my boss, she's able to go brief the four star. And she'll say, he'll say, okay. She says, Sarnarius, what do you have? And she'll run down what I'm doing, where I'm at, and when I'm TDY. She sits in the chair if she's there. That's the confidence and trust I have in a master sergeant who works for me directly. 
What I'm driving to you all right now, when you talk about the trust across your team, who's your team of teams? And how do you work with them to stay informed, credible, and stay after the things that are important to your airmen? That should include your first son. should include your other flight chiefs and NCRCs inside of your section. And when do you meet them? There should be other than just when the boss brings them in a staff meeting. What are your engagements to work your priorities to take care of airmen? And how do airmen bring issues to you? That's what's relevant to me as chiefs inside of our command. A lot of things you talked about this week, we got some character development. We looked at some development stuff. And today is a focus of how we get at it inside of our command. That was the beauty of today. And so I thank you for your attentiveness. I'll stand by for a little feedback. But more importantly, I look for your active involvement and engagement. And hopefully today, I look for a spider web of communication. I don't care about bureaucracy and lines. You can go to the top and you do it. That's just what chiefs do. Who cool, cool. Heads up, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> because at the end of the day, your engagement is a result of an airman or a mission set. And those things are critically important to me. So why wouldn't you do it? Get to a point of yes. Get to a point to where we're solution oriented. It's these relationships that we're forming right now in the command that will ensure that we can fight and win no matter what happens inside of our AOM. I'm confident you're gonna be able to do all the things we expect of you as new chiefs or chiefs inside of our United States Air Force. I just need you to trust and really sit back and take in and look at where you need to be. The gap, where you are now and where you need to be. And strive to always work on your professional and personal growth. And realize there's others that can help you get there if you have the courage to voice it. And those are people that are here on your team around you. And so with that, thank you for your leadership. I've enjoyed the week. Safe travels back. <laughs>